Welcome to our Big Leap podcast. I'm Gay Hendricks, and we're going to have a big exploration today of what is the movie of your life? How to turn your life into a movie that someone else would want to watch, particularly yourself. Mike? Yes. And we also are going to be talking about sharing your Big Leap message with movies, TV, novels, and more, because both Gay and I have done just that. Gay has actually written lots of books. He's also written a novel, and his novels, some of his programs, are either slated to be on TV or movies. I've done a feature film. So we're really going to talk about not only thinking about your life through a completely different lens, but also being able to grow your message and grow what it is you're doing in the world. So anything else, Gay, before we get the show on the road? It's all about a movie and a movie that you'd want to watch. All right. So all that and more, hold on, and we'll be right back with you. Here we are, Gay Hendricks. Mike, great to be with you again. I've got a big question for you right now. Go for it. What kind of donkeys are you smuggling? What kind of donkeys am I smuggling? Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. Yeah. Way back in the Middle Ages, there was a caravan would come to the same crossing point, like between Afghanistan and Iran, and the border inspector would go all the way through the donkey caravan and looking for what's the contraband that they're smuggling because the 30 donkeys each time were led by this wily old character who the customs inspector just knew was a smuggler. And so he would look through all the baggage for dope and whatever, and he could never find anything. And so week after week, the, um, the um, guy would come through the crossing. And so after 30 years or so, the uh, customs inspector was going to resign. And so he came to the old old uh, smuggler and he said, look, I'm not going to bust you for this. I'm going to I'd be retiring. I won't tell on you. You just got to tell me, though, what have you been smuggling all of these years? And the guy said donkeys. And so he was smuggling something in in a way that nobody even thought of it because it was so intrinsic to the story that was being told. And so nobody suspected that it was donkeys themselves that were being smuggled. So here's the interesting thing that I take away from that. And that is that we're all, you and I and everybody else that's creative and wants to market to the world, we're all smuggling donkeys in one way or the other. And so what donkeys are you smuggling? Well, see, for me, the reason I started writing novels, I started writing mystery novels when I was uh, 65 years old, about 10 years ago. And uh, since then, I've published uh, eight or nine, and I have two or three more in the works. And so what it's about for me, it's a donkey smuggling expedition, because all of my mystery novels work in some relationship themes that I want the world to know about or something about self-esteem or something about the big leap or the upper limit problem. So I'm smuggling donkeys by writing stories and making movies around things that have ideas that I want to smuggle out into the world uh, to people who might not ever read a self-help book or might not ever pick up a copy of an Eckhart Tolle book or anything like that. And so um that's the reason uh, I wanted to find out from you, from based on what I've said here, what are you really smuggling into the work you do? What is the main ideas you want to give, whether it's a movie or a TV show or a book or whatever? Yeah, well, um, as I listen to you, one one of the things that I'll say just on a on a big level, some of the clients I've worked with, what I uh, one guy, for example, he's 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 a, he's a Mormon, LDS, so he's very Christiany, and I said, your job in order to elevate your own uh, level of value and package yourself is to craft parables. So you want to um, share transformational stories and journeys about how you are the guide, you're the wizard, bringing them along the line, and you can even use you're the Christ figure in this case. 
um, when you're talking to you know a certain audience, and do that with three transformational parables because and and that's the way that you can smuggle donkeys. So in a way, I'm in the business of inventing donkey smuggling strategies for people to elevate and amplify their message. I mean, that's what I've been doing for the past few years is teaching people how to tell transformational stories that um, allow them to sh get their message out, um, get more attention, package them their products and services so they're seen as being the premium. Um, and the underneath that work what I'm really doing is teaching people how to value themselves, how to release their attachment to old traumas, identity challenges that prevent them from um, being worth more and accepting and receiving more. That's the deep psychology that I've dealt with. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, you've got self-worth issues. Um, chances are you're not telling effective stories that connect with an audience. You're talking about yourself too much. So that's been a thematic um, message, which is I help people hack human psychology to get more attention and be seen as, as a transformer. Yeah, and you've done a great job of bringing that to life, too. I really appreciate the way you've done that because mm. – you have amazing clients out there doing remarkable things. And there's an old saying, too, that a master is not known by the number of students they have, but by the number of students that become masters themselves. And so I focus on that a lot when I'm working with people. Uh, like I usually mentor three or four people a year and um, in intensive work where I meet with them a couple of times a, a month. and I only do it with a few people because it leads to a lot of back and forth. You know, we're always sending each other texts and things like that. And I don't know about you, Mike, but I have a kind of a limit on the number of texts I can process in a given day before my brain starts melting down. And uh, it's such a convenient thing and I'm doing it all the time. But then I realize at the end of the day, I've, I've spent 30 minutes of my life punching out something as I've walked from place to place. Anyway, um, but um, to me, also, we always have to have the why in the background of why we're doing what we're doing, because this is an age when just writing a book is probably not going to be enough. You need to get yeah. out there with your image out in the world and people need to hear your voice. I mean, after all, the origin of the word personality in Latin, persona, means through sound. The ancient Romans said, you tell a lot about a person's personality be the actual tone of their voice. And so as you're speaking to people, what is the message that you're really communicating? For me, I'm always interested in communicating a message of discovery, the excitement of what it is to discover things about ourselves, to break through a limiting belief. You know, in this office, I've had the pleasure of, I don't know how many thousands of times having a person break through a limiting belief, but it never gets old. It never gets tiresome. It's always brand new because it's brand new for them. And so it's brand new for me too. And early on in life, I figured out it's our sense of aliveness when we're going about what we're doing that makes such a huge difference. Because in the course of my uh, 20 years ago, I wrote my book, The Corporate Mystic. And in the course of interviewing about 80 to 100 multimillionaire, super successful executives um, to write that book, one thing I discovered is that even people that might be worth four or five hundred million dollars, or even in a couple of cases, are people I worked with that were billionaires and beyond, that there's something there that still is keeping them from having a real genuine experience of loving being here, loving what they're doing. And so a lot of times in my work with people, it's finding out that place in themselves that's not been fully looked at, loved, opened up to. But the great punchline of that, Mike, and everybody paying attention to this, is that that is the key to your salvation, to your liberation, because at the bottom of that sticky issue, the one that is kept recycling over and over again, 
if you can move up to it in the correct way with enough consciousness and acceptance and love, that will lead you to the breakthrough that you're looking for that will lead you to the creative thing that's coming out of that. Because one thing I've totally convinced of in my 75 years here on this planet is that creativity is something that feels the best, but often people resist it the most because sometimes we fear its raw edge and its unpredictability and not knowing where it's going to take us. But that's where the big fun is in life, you know? And if you're not willing to go there, if you're not willing to open up to that stuff that's really at the heart of everything that brings you here, you're probably not a good candidate for the Big Leap podcast <laughs> or the Big Leap year uh, because the kind of people we want to hang out with are probably like the people that you are that are listening to this and watching this. You're keenly interested in moving through even the last little barrier. You may be other wildly successful in some area, but also still blocked in another area like relationship or self-esteem or something like that. Or you may be wildly talented, but haven't been able to monetize it in a successful way. So no matter where we are in life, there's always that little pocket that we need to keep opening up to because I don't think we ever arrive. It's the journey that really matters. And I want my journey to be a journey of discovery and excitement and discovery of things that I haven't known before. Uh, to me, that makes a rich day if I can discover something about myself or somebody that I haven't known before. So that's a lot of the why underneath um, a lot of the novels I write and uh, the movies I've produced and written and that kind of thing. It's to kind of smuggle these donkey messages into places where they wouldn't already, already uh, be. Yeah. I, when I listen to you, Gay, um, I know my why is I love entertainment and I love to entertain and that's a huge driver is, it, you know, if, if someone said, so if you only did one thing throughout the day, what would you be doing? And first of all, it's sort of like, well, it's not the way my brain operates. But if I had to pick one thing, I just like creating shows, I like helping people create shows. I like finding interesting things to explore, to think about. And I think the act of nuanced conversation is a beautiful uh, form. And at the same time, um, you know, getting back to the theme of this episode, it's how do you turn your life into a movie? How do you share your whatever your big leap message is with multiple mediums so that you can effectively smuggle donkeys? Yeah. So I want to ask you a couple questions, Gay, which is, you know, you've written how many total books so far? What is what is the count right now? I have. 46, I believe, published and one coming out in the spring and a couple more coming out this next year and then a few more novels coming out over the next few years. So in the in the final total, it's probably ones I've already written is maybe 52 or so um, and about 46 of those have been published. Great. So out of those, you, most of them were, you know, what would be considered self-help, personal growth, personal development, relationship, advice. But then uh, you made a detour and mm -hmm. started doing the mystery novel, the detective story. And I want to talk a little bit about moving from a one genre to a completely different one, because that's somewhere where... You know, I consider myself a storyteller. I can find a story in just about anything and and guide someone through it. But I haven't thought through the lens of developing characters as a vehicle and using um, that. So I want you to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, your tell us about your mystery series, how many there are, and the fact that they were developed not just as a book, but I believe optioned for television and or movies as well. And, yep. you know, you've gone down the path of creating uh, all sorts of mediums to effectively smuggle your donkey. So I'd love you to, first of all, talk a little bit about the process and uh, what you've learned from that and any advice you'd have for someone who would want to cross over through multiple mediums. And I'll get a little more specific in asking you questions in a moment, but uh, I'd love your take on that. 
Well, just sitting here since we started this episode, I've got a good treatment outline for the movie about your life. So I want to talk about that shortly, but I'll. I'll All uh, right. That sounds uh, like. Talk. Yeah. And so, um, well, let me just go ahead and say that first, because I think it'll lead into what I want to talk about, about the other thing. But imagine that you had a television show and different parts of yourself that you've talked about in your story were characters like you'd have the the geek that is insanely good at computers but totally sucks at what did you suck at at the time well all thing thing all things related to discipline authority school like i am physically completely incapable of staying awake in a classroom environment yeah. that's why i teach so okay, that's I, a character learn, right see that's a character right there Okay. Is the, the wild and crazy geek who's always rebelling against authority, even the slightest mention of authority, he gets bristled at. But but he's not the only character. See, there's all sorts of rich characters. There's another guy there who's sort of a director. He he likes to direct things. He's kind of like standing in the background all the time, moving the pieces around. Okay, so that's another character. So anyway, you've got the makings of a great television series right there in yourself. And it has healing value, too, because the more you understand your hacker and the more you understand your uh, uh, your compassionate guru or your uh, standing back director, the more you get to understand and resonate and ultimately love different parts of yourself. See, I think to me, good creative work is to entertain ourselves and other people. I want to write movies and write books that I want to read. That's how I got uh, originally into mystery novels because I love mysteries and I fell in love with Sherlock Holmes when I was 12 years old and basically was never without the adventures of Sherlock Holmes under my arm when I was a, my own form, form of a, a, a fat, dorky-looking eighth grader in my uh, big book of Sherlock Holmes. And so, and to this day, when I go on a trip, I take the adventures of Sherlock Holmes with me, now in a compressed form on my uh, iPad. But uh, what I'm getting at is I lived mysteries for 50 years before I wrote one. And I was I knew the form. I knew how you had to do it. I'd figured out the moves that a detective has to make. And so um, I think can that... You, can you give us like the premise behind the book and the character and what it is. What donkeys are you smuggling in your books, for example? I'd love you to tell people about that to give them an idea of your framework. Let me give you the opening scene of the first novel. It's called The First Rule of Ten. His nickname is Ten. His his actual name is Tenzing Norbu. And he's a transplanted. His mother was a an American spiritual seeker hippie who came to Dharamsala to work with the uh, Dalai Lama and Tibetan Buddhists and that kind of thing, and then met Tenzing's father, who was a, in a, an abbot at a local Tibetan Buddhist monastery, not the Dalai Lamas, but another one in the area. And so they got together and had this sort of illicit affair. And that was the, and uh, Tenzing was the product of that. And so he grew up in a monastery half the time, but when he would go to visit his mother, he would live in Paris or wherever she happened to live. And so he got this very unusual background. So when the opening scene, He's standing on the bluffs at the Pacific Palisades, just uh, north of L.A., and he's looking back toward Asia. And this was the scene that came to me. And he's looking and he said, OK, am I an Asian or am I American? Am I a, in L am I a citizen of L.A.? Or who am I? What am I doing here? And it started out with that question, that intimacy question of who am I? What am I doing here? What's my ultimate purpose? And from that moment of building my character, that took me into the mystery because I, I set up a dialogue with him where I, as the writer, I said, Tenzing, what exactly are you doing there on the bluff? And he said, I'm trying to figure out whether I'm an Asian or an American. 
And so we kept this dialogue going. I said, okay, well, what are you going to do when you go back home? And he said, I'm going to make um, some tea and then I'm going to meditate. And then I'm probably just going to hang out and play with my cat for the morning because it's my day off. And I said, oh, well, what, what do you do on your day on? And he said, well, I used to be a, um, a policeman in LA because I got a job one summer as an intern in the police department. And that led to a multicultural program where they were trying to uh, get Asians in, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I said, so you're a cop. And he said, well, no, I'm a private detective. And I quit being a policeman because I didn't like the rules and the structure of it. And so I started the dialogue with my character. And then I said, what, what are you working on right now as a private detective? And he said, well, I'm mixed up because this thing happened yesterday where I got a visit from a woman looking for someone and I kind of pushed her away. I, I was something I didn't want to deal with. And I, I kind of felt like I insulted her a little bit. And now I feel some regret about that. And so that began this emotional connection. So I, I, I think I want to pause there because that's enough of a chunk of stuff. It, it came from me wondering, okay, I would love to write a mystery novel. Hmm, if I were going to write a mystery novel, who would my hero be? And that's when this dialogue started. So at every stage of the game, I just talk to him and find out what he's doing, and then I write it down. I mean, obviously, that's all coming from my brain, but it sort of doesn't feel that way. It sort of feels like I've I've created this real being, and he's rich, and he, I'm rich in He's not rich in money, but he's rich in life experience. And I'm always drawing on it. So the donkey smuggling is to bring in the stuff he learned in the monastery, the things about meditation and the things about uh, karma. Um, and then he has to look at his own karma. You know, so there's always this feedback loop of uh, him doing stuff in the outside world and then being in the inner world. So then, I, OK, so I. I wrote five of those, and I have two others in the pipeline. Then I decided to do something completely different. I decided to write another mystery about a kind of a Victorian-era dandy named Sir Errol Hyde. And these names just came to me. I um, uh, Again, I just kind of had, okay, I was, if I were going to write another mystery novel, I want to take some time off from Tibetan Buddhism. What would I write? Hmm, I'd like to write somebody that's randy and profane and unconventional and, um, you know, does unconventional things. And, you know, like Sherlock Holmes in a way, like Sherlock Holmes, uh, not that I would recommend this, but he was a, uh, uh, a fan of cocaine, which was you could get legally at the time, uh, in liquid form. And so in, in the uh, Sherlock Holmes novels, he sometimes takes a, a hit of uh, cocaine. And that's very unconventional to read in a mystery novel, you know? And so uh, that caught my attention. So I want to have my guy be really something unusual like that. And so I made him a, a Victorian era dandy who's an, a, a minor aristocrat. He's the seventh Earl of Hyde Manor. His name is Sir Errol Hyde. And he's uh, got a little aristocratic money left, but he's not by any means a wealthy landover or anything, landowner. And so he gets involved in solving mysteries. And so there's three of those available now, the first adventure of Sir Errol Hyde, the second, the third. And I've got uh, three more of those in the pipeline. So to me, it's I, I love to write. And um, it's just... Uh, fun for me to do something that's not maybe as serious as something I would go on Oprah with or something like that. Not that Oprah's on anymore, but um, in the old days, oftentimes when I would be working on a book, I would be thinking of how will I present this on talk shows. So I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind in any kind of writing situation or creative art situation is how am I going to present this to the world? Uh, I like to start thinking about that stuff from the very beginning. In fact, here's a technique that I use. When I'm thinking about writing a new book, I will go down to the bookstore and stand in that section and just look at the section of books that my book is going to be in a year or two down the line and say, okay, 
what can I add to this that nobody but me could add? See, because I'm always after helping people find their unique abilities. What is it that's singular to you? Like for you, Mike, how can you use your amazing hacking skill for good? That's what you've turned your life into. Now, I can, if I were going to write the movie of your life, I would also write that you come this close from ending up in prison. <laughs> but congratulations, by the way. Any, I won't make any comments. I won't make any yeah, comments. Can, Someday I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story about how I I learned how to hack the cable system, and that didn't end well. Uh, fortunately, it turned around where everything ended up happily ever after. But I did get hauled down to a police station once, and uh, they threw me in a room for. Um, about an hour and a half, you know, behind one of the, the mirrored rooms just to scare me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it's happened twice. I've been hauled down. Uh, the other time I, I mooned a meter maid. Um, <laughs> I just, I was in the back of a van with a bunch of friends and suddenly that seemed really funny. And what I didn't realize is that meter maids are considered cops and that's called exposure. Uh -huh. It turned out there was a flasher in my hometown around that time who was causing some trouble and they thought I might be them. And I was like 16 years old, but the cops came down, threw me in a room and scared the hell out of me. And that never happened again. But uh, anyway, here's what I, I took from this and is important is <clears throat> as a form of really self-expression for you, you've figured out. Um, how to express yourself and do it through, as you said, creating characters you admire and literally creating conversations as if they're real people in your head. And when you listen to other novelists who write, that is one of their techniques and strategies is to do just that. And all the stuff that you can pack in and then you, you have different aspects of yourself. You can create multiple characters as well. Parts of yourself you hate, parts of yourself you like. And I hadn't thought through that lens before. So I learned a lot thinking about this and listening to you today. And <clears throat> I think getting back to our original theme of this podcast were two core concepts. One of them is how can you turn your life into a movie that you'd actually want to watch that using what you started out at first and be able to donkle, donkey smuggle messages that add value to other people. But it's also an opportunity for a new level of self-discovery to maybe see aspects of yourself and present them as a character, um, an alter ego, and that's a, a, a beautiful form of separation. It's almost therapeutic in nature to go really deep, to go dark and explore parts of yourself that maybe you wouldn't have the courage to do with different parts of your senses, whether it would be you as a murderer, you as a sex addict, or whatever it is, you can explore parts of yourself that you simply wouldn't do in your flesh and bones body. And... Um, and that also makes it a lot easier to craft some characters, too. I can see it's much easier to get into the mode of writing by crafting characters like that. And there's lots and lots of tools to do it as well. So um, I'm curious just to get into a little bit <clears throat> of a how-to here. Is there anything you want to talk about in terms of how you got attention for some of your novels and got it in front of some studio people? In Hollywood. Do you want to just touch on that just a little bit? Yeah, although I don't know if my experience is going to be that helpful because it was so easy for me. Okay. Uh, and I think it'll be easy for people to the extent that they the stuff they put out is just a pure expression of their essence. And so it was so easy for me. Uh, I'll just tell you places where it was so easy, where it's usually so hard. I was finishing the first Tenzing book and I hadn't even thought about the publisher yet or who I was going to send it to or whether it was going to be something I might even self publish. And so I didn't even know whether it was any good or not, basically. And so I was working on it one day, kind of coming into the completion. And I had sent a letter to a woman who was the acquisitions person at a big publishing house. And Hay House. 
And so I knew her from times past. And one of my students had written a book and I'd send it to Patty to look at and say, would you be interested in publishing my students' books? But anyway, that's why I ended up talking to her because I called to check on that book and say, have you had a chance to read my student's book yet? So she hadn't, but she said, what are you working on these days? And I said, well, probably something you guys wouldn't be interested in because it's not a self-help book. And she said, oh, what is it? And I said, well, it's a a mystery novel about a Tibetan Buddhist in, in detective in Los Angeles. And he goes about solving crimes and everything, but he's also has issues in relationships with women that he's working out. And um, he has a complexity to him that's uh, maybe different than in a lot of detective novels. And um, she said, well, do you know that Hay House is beginning to publish some novels? We're setting up a special section where we're publishing novels. And I said, no, I did not know that. And I said, would you like to look at my a mystery novel. And I sent it off to her and pretty much got by return mail said, yeah, we want to publish it. Then this is, gets even better. So by the time the first one was published, I'd written the second one and I'd gotten a co-author, Tinker Lindsay, that I work with. And so she and I got to be really tight writing these books over five or six books. And so, um, Tinker's very well connected in Hollywood because her former husband, Ned Beatty, was also an actor, and um, so she knows a lot of people in Hollywood. But right away, we put the word out about the the book that was coming out, and we got inquiries from various agents and a couple of producers, and we immediately signed a deal with one producer. Big moment to pause here because the movie never got made. It developed into one of those typical Hollywood stories where one thing led to another and then things bogged down and then the producer did another movie and it completely lost its oomph within the period of time that it needed to be. Usually you sign an option deal for 18 months or something like that. So it's not like you're going to give your option to somebody for the rest of your life. If they can make the movie in 18 months, great. If not, you get your option back. And so now, believe it or not, I've sold the option to those, bo- to those books three different times, one to CBS, one to another outfit, and free money. Free, free money. money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a friend that write, uh, wrote one big hit mystery novel way back about 40 years ago and kind of been living off the royalties ever since. But what he really lives off is the book has been optioned for about 40 years, but they've never made the movie yet, but they keep re-upping the option every year for 10 grand or something like that. And uh, so he kind of uses that as his free money for the year. But uh, yeah, I'm so I've uh, enriched myself off not making the movie yet, but I very much want to have the movie or the TV series made. When this last deal fell through with Netflix, it kind of broke my heart though. So I've had to kind of uh, lick my wounds and get back into action again. Okay. Well, um, that's a good story by the way, but I think my takeaway is, um, you got to look at this with as a one thing leads to the other and you're building connections over time. And in the day we're in this day and age, um, you can build remarkable connections just by reaching out and getting Mm -hmm. podcast interviews. And, um, you know, one of the things that I teach people, I do all the time, I call it money phone, but it's a whole strategy that involves um, thinking about who's your target audience, what kind of affinity groups do they belong to, then another circle is um, what influencers can influence or connect with the affinity groups, but the outer ring are ambassadors. And what you want to do is focus your energy on building ambassador relationships because ambassadors can give you access to um, lots of people, but also influencers who can influence groups. And, you know, one good ambassador can help build and connect you for the rest of your life with everything you'd ever dream of. And so, um, As we get towards the end of this episode, one of the ideas that I want to leave our you, the listener viewer with today is number one, 
<clears throat> think about this donkey smuggling concept and how can you share your big leap message through some sort of a creative medium. Now, in the case of Gay, I didn't even get to tell any of my stories today, Gay, but it doesn't matter. But it's, you know, what movies, TV, novels, and more. But um, more importantly, I love the idea of waking up every day saying, how can I turn my day into a movie that I would actually love to watch and I'd love to share with someone that would be brand representative. And I guarantee you, no one sits around and says, oh, I'd love to watch a movie today about a bum sitting on their couch <laughs> flipping through Facebook and getting <laughs> mad, okay? That's a, that's a, that's a bad movie. And, uh, and I, unfortunately, there's, an, there's an innate, a, a, a remarkable number of people doing it. But I'll give you a... Um, <clears throat> Uh, a, an example of one that is really remarkable. So it turns out there's a guy named Jimmy Chen. Have you heard of him before? No. Okay. Jimmy Chen is, uh, he's a, a professional climber. He's um, he created um, several um, movies and I'm looking at them right now. Uh, Free solo is one. And the other one is Miru. He won an oh. Academy award. I know who you're talking about. Yep. So he was just featured in New York Times this past week. Well, it just so happens he's from my little hometown and went to school with my youngest brother, Joel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other connection I have with him is right now my son, Zach, who's 18, is gone for 80 days straight with a group called Knowles, N-O-L-S. It's Knowles.edu. And they do these adventure mountaineering, rafting, climbing, learning emergency preparedness, leadership skills, no phones for 80 days disconnected in the wilderness. And we believe he'll come back a different human being. Now, Jimmy is a spokesperson for Knowles. So um, yesterday I wrote my brother, <clears throat> and first of all, the reason I bring Jimmy up is this guy is living, breathing example of someone who's not only living life as a movie, he's making movies mm. that are thrilling and exciting. He's also a National Geographic fellow. And he's, you know, right now he's 46. Um, I'm just looking at him on Wikipedia. He's from Mankato, Minnesota, which is the town right next to Eagle Lake where I grew up. So, um, but Mankato is a big town, right? Anyway, here's the point of the story. I'm reaching out to him to see if we can get him on as a guest on our podcast. And, and part of that is he's a friend of my brother's going way back from, you know, first grade on and um, comes from my hometown. Also, he's a spokesperson person for Knowles that Zach is at. And I'm going to say, hey, look, I want to help get the word out about Knowles. But also this guy has got some big leap stories, literally and figuratively, because if you're like the, the kinds of environments he gets in, involved in are very, very scary mm -hmm. and intense. So I have a big intention for a big leap and a big leap episode, and that is to get Jimmy Chen on here. So, um, again, the theme, the reason for all that is. Think of your life metaphorically as a big leap. What's the movie you can craft today and for the rest of your life? And what medium do you want to express it in? And that's also a very, um, this is a shameless plug for why you want to check out the big leap year, because that's what we want to help you do this next year is find that unique superpower that you have um, amplify it, accelerate it, help you find ways to express it more fully and completely and do it with us over a period of a year. This is a one and only time that gay is going to be doing this. I'm super excited. And you can learn more about that at big leap podcast.com. Gay, how do you want to wrap this one up? Well, I want to say I'm also super excited about uh, this next year, 2021, because it's a big leap year for a lot of people that I know. It's a way of reinventing yourself, and there's no better way to do it than to commit yourself to a year of intense focus on creating that big leap that you're after. And uh, we'll have a lot more to say about the books that have moved us and the TVs and the movie shows and how to translate your life into a movie or a TV show that you would pay to watch. Right. right on. All right. So 
I think that pretty much wraps this one up. Um, best w- thing you can do right now is if you know someone who could benefit from listening to this episode and thinking about donkey smuggling, well, um, share it with them. And of course, head on over to iTunes and rate and review. Also, the Big Leap app is up. So go download that at the App Store or on the Google Play Store. It's available on both platforms. That's one of the ways we'll be communicating with you and delivering the Big Leap Year. And also, it's a way for you to communicate with Gay and me and get bonus content. And finally, head on over to BigLeapPodcast.com, apply for the Big Leap Year, and stay tuned for another crazy episode. Gay, anything else you want to leave before we let him go? Yeah, big question. How much love, abundance, and creativity are you willing to let into your life today? Mm, Very good. Very good. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.